Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about sampling and data. Basically uh, introduce statistics, uh, what it is, why we use it, how we use it, um, how do we get information we can use for t statistics, and uh, what can it tell us. So first off, uh, when do we use statistics? Um, we use it really all the time. We get information all the time. We get these statistics all the time from things like newspapers, TV, internet. Um, think about the weather. Uh, it was recently quite hot in Korea and um, we might hear on the news that this is the hottest year to date and basically they're using other data points from prior years to be able to make some claim about um, the current state or the, the current situation right now in terms of weather. Um, on internet, uh, you might hear statistics about, um, you know, some drug uh, producing bad side effects if you take the drug or some drug that cures every, uh, you know, ailment in the world and they give some statistics. So, for example, 95% of people um, were magically cured by this pill. Um, so we, we get statistics all the time, and what I'm also trying to illustrate here is that um, the statistics that we get from things like newspaper, TV, and internet, um, we're, we're constantly getting this information, but it might not be either uh, correct, first off, or complete, or completely understood. Um, so there's a lot of problems. Um, we... we let me let me rephrase this. We use statistics all the time, but there are a lot of problems with the quality of the statistics that we see normally in newspapers, TV, and internet. So part of this is a, a problem of the people who are um, consuming these these sources, uh, not knowing how to properly interpret data. Um, but part of it is also a problem of the newspapers and TV and internet and other sources that are attempting to uh, display the data in a way that says something that it doesn't actually say. So uh, I guess when do we use statistics? We use statistics whenever we're trying to make decisions. Um, we get them from a lot of different sources. And we get statistics about, for example, crime and sports and education, politics, real estate, and lots of other things. Um, there are statistics, or there can be statistics, about pretty much everything you do. Most choices you make, um, you are um, thinking about the statistics at least in the back of your mind. So uh, we can use statistics from different sources to, for example, say, uh, is the crime rate in um, Seoul greater than the crime rate in Chuncheon? Is it safer, for example, to be in, in Chuncheon? And we can use statistics to answer that question. Uh, we can use statistics to figure out um, what uh, major, for example, a university is more likely to uh, get a job in, I don't know, fighting crime, or is more likely to get a job overseas, or is more likely to get a job as a doctor, something like that. Um, we can use statistics or data points to be able to predict the likelihood or the outcome uh, in the future. Um, and there are statistics, again, about everything. We, we really rely on statistics to make most of our decisions. Um, so it helps you to make a decision about the correctness of some statement. right? So really what we're doing with statistics is attempting to make decisions and we want to make hopefully correct decisions, right? So um, statistics helps you to make a decision about the correctness of some statement. So for example, or not for example, just for practice, uh, how much do you sleep? Uh, I find Hallam University students don't sleep nearly enough. <laughs> you probably should sleep much more, um, but think about how much do you sleep? And we have this uh, little chart here um, that shows how much uh, how much people sleep. So this is, for example, between five hours and nine hours, and the circles here uh, represent one person. Um, one person. Uh, we can see that the majority of people, or the, the most common hours that people slept or uh, would be about six and a half hours, right? So we kind of have this, this grouping around or between six 
uh, and seven hours. And that's where really the most people were, were falling with five being kind of an extreme and nine being an extreme and actually very few people sleeping eight hours, which is the recommended amount of sleep, by the way. Um, so think about how much you sleep and think about the uh, samples that were collected here. Each of the circles are what we call samples where, for example, one student was asked, uh, how much do you sleep per night? And they responded, and then they got a circle. If they said, for example, six and a half hours, um, then one of the circles represents one sample. So uh, does your dot plot look the same or different from this example? So if, you, um, if you're thinking about your sleep, right? Your sleep, for example, on a, a weekly average. Let's assume that um, before you started uh, uh, this semester, whenever you were at home, you might have slept, for example, nine, 10, or more hours per night, maybe. Um, and then now that you uh, are, are in classes, you probably sleep a little bit less. So think about your, your average weekly sleep. Um, what do you think? What do you think it would be um, if you sampled the the number of hours per night? Would your chart look similar to this or not? So, for example, in this case, uh, maybe the nine hours. If this is all the samples from the same person, then maybe nine hours was on a weekend, uh, eight hours was on days they didn't have class, um, and then most of the time, if they had class or if they were studying or whatever, then they would have six, six and a half hours, maybe seven hours of sleep. So think about your sleep patterns. Would you make a plot or think about the sleep patterns of you and your friends where you sample not only yourself on a weekly basis, but maybe you sample uh, for one night all of your friends on that night. How, how much did they sleep? Would you get about the same uh, plot or not? If you did the example in an English class with the same number of students, do you think the results would be the same? So in this case, you ask each student, uh, how many hours did you sleep last night, right? Because we want to measure the same night that they slept. Um, so if you did the same example in an English class with the same number of students, do you think the results would be the same? Why or why not? And in this case, uh, we're looking at groups. So this is a, a statistics class. Let's assume that we, we sampled every student in the statistics class and we got this plot. Then we went to an English class, still on Hall Hallam University campus, still Hallam University students, but we went to an English uh, language class. Do you think that their plot would look the same or not? And what are some reasons that it might look different or what are some reasons that it might look the same? Well, some reasons that it might look the same are um, that they're all still Hallam University students. They probably have, for example, the same after-school activities or partying or whatever it is that Hallam students do after classes. Um, and on average, I think uh, most, most university students sleep about the same amount of time uh, per night with some extremes on both sides. Um, so... It, it would be a very interesting question, or potentially interesting, is there a difference in sleep patterns between statistics class students and English class students? You know, there, and if there is a difference, what is that difference? What causes that difference? Um, if there's a difference in sleep, then we can start to use statistics to ask other questions like, if the English class students sleep more, do they actually do better in class? Do they do worse in class, right? So there's a lot of different questions that can come up from this. But think about here, we are trying to measure two different groups to see how similar or how different those groups actually are. Um, I'm just off the top of my head guessing, most likely the plots would be very similar for, for these classes just because all university students tend to have relatively similar sleep patterns. Now, if we asked, for example, the students and the professors about their sleep, how much sleep they got, um, I think it would be very different because those are two relatively different groups of people um, that have you know, different, potentially different sleep patterns. Uh, where do your data appear to cluster? And how might you 
interpret this clustering. So a cluster is where we have groups of data together. So on this plot, where's the data clustering? Basically, I see a cluster between, um, you can say between six and seven hours. Uh, you might include five and a half hours, but I would probably say clustering really starts at six and seven hours. And, and what does this mean? This means that um, the average sleep time is somewhere between there, most likely. So the majority of people, or uh, this group of people, have something in common that, for example, the person at nine hours does not have in common. So the nine-hour person is, is quite different from where this clustering is happening. And really, the five-hour person is quite different as well. So again, we can start to ask other questions. We have this clustering with, with kind of uh, potentially the average or um, let's say what a what the normal part of the group um, uh, is sleeping at the, the number of hours that group is sleeping at and then we have these kind of extremes so then we can start to ask questions like well what what's causing these extremes are these people um, uh, you know overworked are they stressed so they can only sleep a few hours a night or maybe they're stressed so they sleep more um, what what exactly is causing uh, these kind of extremes outside of the clustering. So uh, clustering can tell us a lot of things. In this case, um, yeah, I mean, it's just a way to, to figure out what is kind of your normal, normal group uh, within your data set. So some definitions. First off, what is statistics? Statistics deals with the collection, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of data. Remember, collection, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of data. Uh, we have to collect raw data. So, for example, uh, like the plot we just saw, we sampled, we asked each person, how many hours did you sleep last night? Right. So we are, we are using that question to collect data. Once we have that data, we need to put it in a form that we can analyze or that we can say something about right so analyze i mean what does this data tell us already um kind of explicitly or implicitly what does this data tell us and then once we've analyzed it we can interpret what that actually means so in the in the last case we analyzed where um, the data points were clustering at right so once we understood where the cluster was we analyzed the data we know where the clusters are, then we can interpret what that clustering actually means. Um, and then really we're interested in what the interpretation is because that tells us uh, what we think is causing that, what attributes are causing this clustering or this interesting data point to happen. Uh, and then finally, presentation of data. We have to present our interpretation or present our results. That way uh, we can actually say uh, what this data tells us or what this data should tell us. So statistics deals with the collection, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of data. Um, if you don't have good data collection, you, you will have bad analysis and bad interpretation. Uh, if you have good data collection but bad analysis, you'll also have bad interpretation. If you have good collection and good analysis uh, and bad interpretation, then your presentation... Uh, might look good, but might be false, actually. Um, so all of those things are actually very, very important. And really, most people fail in statistics at the collection phase. Um, there's a lot of techniques for analysis, and analysis can be complicated. Um, but really, most people fail uh, because they improperly collect data. And once, once you've collected data improperly, or you have the wrong data, then anything that you base, any information you base off of that data uh, is likely to be lower quality or just incorrect. Descriptive statistics is organizing and summarizing the data itself. Descriptive statistics is probably the easiest form of statistics that you can do. Um, it doesn't really require a lot of analysis. You just have to organize the data and say something about the data itself, and we'll talk quite a bit about that. Inferential statistics is where it gets more complicated, but also much, much more interesting than, uh, than descriptive statistics. It's where formal methods uh, for drawing conclusions from 
good data. Like I said, uh, you have to have good data or high quality data to be able to make um, true, correct uh, co conclusions or inter interpret the data correctly. Um, right, so in inferential statistics, we're actually uh, drawing conclusions from some type of analysis, uh, concluding things about. Um, about the data. Statistical inference uses probability uh, probability to determine how confident we can be that our conclusions are correct. So let me let me repeat that. Statistical inference uses probability to determine how confident we can be that our conclusions are correct. Now think about this. We can use uh, probabilistic methods to determine um, how true or how confident can we be that some statement that we make is true? And that's the very powerful thing about statistics. If we have enough data, and we usually need quite a bit, and that data is very high quality, then we can say, we can make statements about the data and measure how confident we can be about them. All right? So we can essentially measure um, how, how wrong or how right is it? How likely is it to be wrong or right? Um, and we'll talk more about inferential statistics a lot and how we calculate uh, how, uh, how confident we can be about our conclusions. Okay. So next probability, uh, I think everyone knows this, is a mathematical tool used to study randomness. Um, a population is a collection of persons, things, or objects under study. Now we'll deal with populations quite a bit um, and so just realize that a population is a collection of person, things, or objects under study. A sample is a portion or subset of the larger population. So for example, we might have a population which is all Koreans, right? But if I'm going to do a study, I am not going to ask every single Korean in the world um, about you know my question. I'm not going to be able to find every single Korean, so I need to take a sample, which is a portion or subset of the larger population, which means if I ask um, you know a large number of Koreans, but not every single one, um, then that group, that subset of Koreans that I actually ask, serve as my sample for this study. Now, if we could ask the population, then our data would be very high quality, very accurate. But it's completely, in the case of asking every single Korean in the world, it's impractical, right? So in almost every study, you'll find that people are sampling because it's impractical to ask the entire population. Um, there's a lot of problems and a lot of considerations that come with sampling, and we'll talk about talk about them, but for now understand that the population is the object or the, the person, thing, or object under study, and a sample is a portion or subset of that larger population that we actually um, ask or actually study. So sampling is selecting a portion or subset of the larger population and study that portion uh, to gain information about the population. We're trying to understand here uh, the population right? But surveying or studying the entire population is most likely impractical, so we have to select a subset of the entire population to do our sampling, right? So sampling is selecting a portion of the larger population to study that portion uh, uh, to gain information about the overall population. Um, so think of it like um, Let's say every uh, cancer patient, we want to we want to cure cancer, and there's a new drug that cures cancer. Um, we obviously can't test the drug on every single cancer patient, um, but we can do a study of let's say 100 cancer patients um, with a specific type of cancer. So our population are people, every person with that particular type of cancer. And our sample are these 100 people that we can actually, um, you know, test the drug on, uh, right? So just think there is a difference between population. It's the greater thing. Sample is a, a subset of that. And sampling is actually asking or working, studying with the subset. Uh, 
um, to gain information about the overall population. Now, a statistic is a number that represents a property of the sample. And we'll talk more about what a statistic is, but for now, a number that represents the property of a sample. A parameter is a number that is a property of the population, right? So here we're talking about, again, samples and populations. So a statistic, a number that represents a property of the sample, which is the small group of, of people that we um, uh, sampled. And a parameter is the number uh, number that's a property of the population, not just the sample, the entire population. So we're trying to find information or attributes about um, the sample. So we, our statistic, for example, um, describes the sample. But that statistic might not necessarily describe the population, uh, depending on how we did our study. Um, a parameter is a number that is a property of the population itself. Now, a representative sample is a sample containing the characteristics of the population. And this is the critical piece, right? So we have a population, let's say all Koreans in the world. We have a sample, which is 100 Koreans that I collect, that I, that I randomly found, okay? Um, if I walked around Hallam University campus and I just came across the first 100 Koreans, is that sample representative of the entire Korean population? No, obviously not. And the reason is because the first 100 Koreans that I find on Hallam University campus, first off, all go to the same university. Um, they're most likely college-age students and potentially some professors. Um, they may or may not have worked before. Um, they really it doesn't describe the entire population of Korean people at all. It describes, well, the population of Hallam University students. I won't even say university students in Korea. It just describes Hallam University students. Um, so we really have to think about what group, uh, what sample group actually represents the population. What sample group has the characteristics of the population, and how can we make sure that we're actually making samples or finding samples that represent what we're trying to study properly. And that's, it turns out to be very difficult sometimes, especially if the uh, um, population is very diverse. So a variable uh, noted by capital letters such as X and Y is a characteristic of interest for each person or thing in a population. So um, think of a variable as some characteristic that we're interested in. How many um, Hallam University students have blonde hair, for example? Uh, blonde hair might be defined as variable B or something like that, right? So uh, we use variables to um, uh, denote some characteristic that is uh, changeable um, or something that we want to uh, look for in a uh, population. Numerical variables are values with equal units such as weight in pounds and time in hours. Okay, so I think that's relatively straightforward. Uh, numerical variables, just think of them as, as numbers, something we can actually measure, right? So um, weight in pounds, time in hours, uh, time in minutes, uh, age, um, the, the amount of time that it takes to run around the track, uh, the number of patients that go into Hallam University Hospital, something like that, something that we can actually measure. Uh, categorical, categorical variables are attributes that place a per, uh, the, the person or thing into some sort of category. So before we had numerical variables, and these are things that we can actually you know, measure, categorical variables are things that let us categorize things. So uh, for example, um, eye color. Uh, hair color, um, um, who has a Samsung laptop, like, um, it really could be anything, but you're trying to group people, uh, group uh, whatever we're looking at based on some attribute, and we can't necessarily measure that attribute. You can't measure hair color. I mean, you could potentially measure, you know, how yellow is it? What are the wavelengths coming off of the hair? Um, but, uh, 
really we're, we're talking about categories. So for example, I don't know, Korean, um, Thai, American, uh, Irish. Well, I mean, like those are different categories of nationalities, for example. And we want to measure the people inside that. So we can say, for example, four, four Irish, uh, 10 Korean, five American, whatever, right? So here we, we measure the amount of uh, uh, people or objects in some sort of category. So one is uh, an actual measurement. One is uh, categorization, putting something into a category. And both methods are very, very uh, powerful for doing statistics. And data is the actual value of the variable. So we have some variable, um, which again represents some sort of characteristic of interest. And once we measure, once we actually ask a person a question or collect a data point, um, once we measure, we find out the actual value of the variable that we're interested in. Mean uh, basically just means average. If you have, for example, x, y, z, um, you have three, three values. You would just divide by three to calculate the mean. Um, we use mean for a lot of different things, but it basically tells us what is the, um, uh, the most common or the, the kind of average over all of the data that we've collected. Proportion is a percent of the whole. Okay, so proportion of, for example, a population. Let's say we collected um, samples from 25% of, of the entire population. Then we have uh, a proportion of the population that we collected samples from. We use proportion quite a bit whenever we're describing uh, the data that we've collected. Uh, so for example, class size 40, we have men 22 and women 18. The proportion uh, men is 22 to, uh, to 40. Proportion of women is 18 to 40. And we can calculate the percentages that way. Okay, so those were some definitions, and I'm, I'm sorry we had to go through that, but... Uh, Usually definitions in English are a little bit different than in Korean, or at least I want to get you used to the terms uh, in English. Um, so I thought I would go through them. They are also in the book, so make sure you read chapters uh, one uh, as soon as possible. Uh, so now some practice. Uh, we want to know the average amount of money first-year college students spend at ABC College on school supplies that do not include books. We randomly survey the first 100 year, uh, 100 first year students at the college. Three of those students spent $150, $200, and $225, respectively. Okay. So what we want to know is first off, what is our population? Think about in this case, what is the population? We want to know the average amount of money first year college students spend at ABC College on school supplies that do not include books. What could our population be? I'll let you think about that. What is our sample? Right. So we randomly survey 100 first year students at the college. Three of those students spent uh, 150, 200, and 225 dollars respectively. What is our sample? What is our parameter here? What is our statistic? What is our variable? Okay. So whenever we're doing a study, we want to at least identify uh, these things. What is our population sample, parameter, statistic, variable, um, and of course, data. What data do we have once we've actually collected information? So here, the population is all first year students attending ABC College this term. Now, notice I'm very, very st specific about first-year students attending ABC College this term. Because if I said all first-year students, that would potentially mean all first-year students in the country or the world or wherever. If I said students attending ABC College this term, that means uh, you know, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, uh, everyone, basically, every student attending the college, I have to be very specific about 
Uh, who am I measuring? What is the population that I'm measuring? And in this case, it is all first-year students attending ABC College this term. The sample could be all students enrolled in one section of a beginning statistics, uh, statistics course at ABC College, although the sample may not represent the entire population. So sample could be all students enrolled in one section of a be beginning statistics course. Uh, let me go back. Yeah. Randomly survey one of the. Uh, we randomly survey 100 first year students at the college. Uh, of those students, we spent 100. So in this case, the sample could be all students enrolled in one section of a beginning statistics course. Um, in the, the example, they said the sample is 100 randomly selected students, right? So um, I was thinking something else whenever I wrote this. The sample here is 100 randomly selected students. Um, as long as they were first-year students attending ABC College. The parameter is the average amount of money spent excluding books by first-year college students at ABC College. And this, this parameter is what we are trying to determine. This is what we're trying to find out by doing this, this uh, survey or this analysis. The statistic is the average amount of money spent by first-year college students. So what we want to know, the parameter is the average amount of money spent by first-year college students at ABC College this term. The statistic is the average amount of money spent. It's actually the amount of money spent by first-year college in the sample. Uh, now remember, a statistic deals with the sample, not the population. The variable could be the amount of money spent uh, by one first-year student. So let X be the amount of money spent, excluding books, by one first-year student attending the college. So here we have a variable, um, and each student will potentially have spent a different amount of money. So we have a sample, and let's say X is the amount of money that that person spent. Um, we might have several samples, and X will change which, with each sample they have. So our variable here uh, could be the amount of money spent by one first-year student. And the data are the dollar amounts spent by the first-year students. Uh, examples of data are 150, 200, 225. So the data that we've collected are all of the dollar amounts. And those dollar amounts per sample are a variable. Um, this tells us, or this gives us some statistic, or we can calculate some statistic about the overall sample, these 100 random, uh, randomly asked students. Um, to calculate basically a parameter of the actual um, uh, population. So more definitions. Uh, qualitative data is the result of categorizing or describing attributes of a population. Um, again, qualitative, we're dealing with categories, not uh, necessarily measurements. Quantitative data, the result of counting or measuring attributes of a population. Uh, quantitative data, we're dealing with numbers, we're dealing with measurements. Uh, quantitative discrete data, data that's the result of counting, for example, the number of books in a backpack. And quantitative continuous data is data that's a result of measuring. So discrete, um, we have data that's a result of counting. Continuous is data that's a result of measuring. Uh, both of them, of course, will give us some numerical value. So it is quantitative, not qualitative, um, but uh, we can differentiate between discrete and continuous data. So some ways of showing uh, qualitative data, uh, qualitative, not quantitative, as in categories, are, for example, pie charts and bar graphs. Um, because we can say, you know, uh, such a, a percent of the population has um, blonde hair, such a percent has black hair. And we can have a, a pie chart that shows that percentage or a bar graph that compares the two. So in this case, we have a pie chart, uh, let's say full-time full and part-time workers. Um, part-time, uh, we can see, uh, is the majority, at least in the left-hand side, actually for both of them. Um, yeah, and this just tells us the, the percentage differences between full-time and part-time uh, with uh, qualitative data. These are categories, uh, two categories here, part-time and full-time. Student status, again, full-time and part-time. Uh, uh, qualitative data, 
again, and we have some measurement about the, the number of students that are uh, full-time and part-time in particular campuses. Uh, percentages, you can use bar, bar charts to uh, show uh, percentages, um, although they can be a little bit confusing. Um, think about think about who you're, you're actually marketing this to. Sometimes it's just easier, for example, uh, we have this table 1.3 at the top, uh, we have the characteristic and category, and the percent. Um, and notice that if we, we add all of that up, it goes over 150%. So um, whenever, especially if we don't have something that adds up to 100%, um, it can be a little bit confusing, so make sure that whenever you're describing this data, you explain, um, you know, what what are they trying to do. Here we can omit data, um, for example, an other category. Um, uh, yeah, uh, we'll talk about when when to omit data later, but just know that you can uh, omitting data, other category included. So in this case, we have another category that was included versus the prior slide where it wasn't included. Um, if we have other or unknown, maybe that doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't add any additional um, information to our study, and sometimes it does. So we have to decide, uh, is this relevant to our study or not? Should we show it to our, um, our users? Okay, so next sampling. Uh, a sample should have the same characteristics as the population it's representing. We've already talked about this, so the population itself is you know, uh, a group of things with some attributes. If you sample those things and you pick um, a subset that, let's say, is very strange, maybe it's, you pick, um, I don't know, a USB stick. Let's say you have a bunch of USB sticks and they're all over... Uh, four gigabytes, right? But whenever you sample, you pick one USB stick and it's one gigabyte instead of four gigabytes. Well, the, the one that you've sampled does not represent the entire population because it's actually the only small one and everything else is much bigger than it. So the sample should have the same characteristics as the population it's representing. So we have to figure out ways to be able to sample um, that gives us that representative um, represent uh, the proper representation. This, of course, can be very hard. Um, so the, the best way to do this is to use random sampling. So in random sampling, each member of a population initially has an equal chance of being selected for the sample. So we have a population of things that we want to sample, and each member of the population initially has an equal chance of being selected for the sample. We'll talk about this a little bit more uh, when we're talking about probability. Um, but let's say that I have you know a hundred people um, that I that I can sample from. Uh, I want to do random sampling and randomly select everyone uh, with an equal chance. Um, and that's that's really the best way to get a representative sample as long as your sample set your subset does actually represent the. Uh, uh, population. A simple random sample, each sample of the same size has an equal chance of being selected. So um, again, what we're trying to do is make sure that the probabilities of selecting uh, a sample uh, are, are the same for every possible sample that I can select, and we'll talk more about this as well. A stratified sample, we divide the population into groups called strata, and then take a proportionate number from each stratum. So rather than being completely random, we just divide the population and we have to figure out how to actually divide the population or stratify the population um, and then take uh, a proportionate number from each stratum. And this, uh, depending on how we do it, will give us um, uh, a representative sample of each strata that we can then compare with each other to make sure that we are uh, getting representative samples. Cluster sample, we can divide the population into clusters or groups and then randomly select some of the clusters. So again, um, just <laughs> how we divide the population is potentially a question. It's probably done randomly. Uh, we divide the population into clusters or groups. 
and then randomly select some of the clusters to be our representatives. Systematic sample, we randomly select a starting point and take every in, uh, nth uh, piece of data from a listing of the population. So in this case, um, it's also, it's not completely random, um, but we try to kind of distribute our sampling throughout the entire uh, population data that we've collected. Um, each of them have, uh, of course, some strengths and each of them have weaknesses. Uh, the easiest, I would say, is uh, complete random sampling. Um, uh, it's the easiest to do, it's the easiest to manage, and it tends to give the best quality uh, data as long as you have large, uh, a large population and a large sample set. Uh, so sampling, non-random, convenient sampling, uses results that are readily available. available. And this is actually what most studies tend to do. So um, a lot of data has already been collected from a lot of different places. Uh, we might have data from you know, prior studies or the newspaper or um, you know, internet or wherever. And uh, the data has already been collected. So people tend to use that. And because they can't really get more data of that same quality or of the same type, um, Maybe they, they can't collect the data themselves. They can only get it from another source. Um, they use non-random uh, convenience sampling, and this uses results that are readily available uh, or data that's readily available. Uh, true random sampling is done with replacement. So uh, I talked about uh, random sampling, which is every, let's say, in this subset where I can sample from any uh, any object or any person or whatever in this subset, uh, true random sampling is done with replacement. And what that means is that if I sample, let's say I have 100 people, and I select one person to be a sample, I measure you know, their variable. I find out what their variables are and get the, the values of their variables. Then I have the option of keeping that person out of the sample, and now my sample has uh, 99 people in it, or my subset has 99 people in it, or I can put that person back in the, uh, in the subset, and the subset has uh, 100 people in it. Now, to make sure that uh, we have exactly the same probability of choosing someone else, or uh, we have exactly the same probability on our next uh, uh, sampling, um, I need to put the person back in the sample to make sure that my probabilities are the same. So true random sampling is done with replacement. That gives me the same probability every time I sample. Uh, many stu studies are done without replacement, and that essentially makes, um, uh, how can I say, it lowers the, the chance, or it makes the chance of, of pulling the same sample again uh, essentially zero, and it increases the likelihood that other attributes are selected. Um, so true random sampling is done with replacement. Many studies are done without replacement. Um, it's not necessarily wrong, but we just have to be aware uh, what replacement or without replacement does to our uh, studies. So sampling errors is error caused by sampling, like the, the set is not large enough. So um, the amount of samples that we've taken, the amount of data that we've collected is not large enough. We will start to get lots of errors uh, because we just don't have enough data to make any uh, conclusions or any analysis properly. Um, so sampling errors uh, can be done because of the sampling process. Either we don't have enough data or uh, the way that we sampled was not um, representative of the actual population. So sampling and how we collect the data is actually really important for making sure that we have high quality um, yeah high quality data to work with so we don't get uh, a bunch of sampling errors essentially uh, non-sampling errors are factors not related to sampling uh, for example defective counting devices uh, anything that um, was not directly caused by the way that we set up our samples and the way that we analyzed our samples. Um, these could be external factors. Sampling bias is created when a sample is collected from a population uh, 
and has some members of the population that are not as likely to be chosen as others. And this also happens in studies very, very often. So, uh, for example, um, if we're in Korea and we are testing a new drug in Korea, most likely that drug is going to be tested on Koreans. Uh, it, it's, it's possible that some foreigners might be in the study, but most likely it's going to be Koreans because the population of Korea is mostly Korean. So in this case, the sampling bias is towards Korean physiology. Um, so the result could be that we might make statements like this drug cures um, this disease in 99% of patients, but maybe that's because of uh, something to do with Korean genetics. Right, so um, it might cure in Koreans ninety nine percent of of this ailment, but in foreigners or um, let's say Japanese, Chinese, Westerners, whatever, um, the percentage is actually much lower because of some genetic reason. I'm not sure what that would be, but I think you understand my point here. We have a sampling bias. So if our sample uh, does not represent the actual population or some members of the population are not as likely to be chosen and sampled as others, then um, uh, it doesn't reflect the overall population and that uh, can cause a lot of problems to occur. Variation are differences in samples. Um, we normally have, um, well, depending on what we're working on, we, we may have very little variation. For example, if I was going to measure the size of my desk. Um, I would measure it over and over again, and the variation would exist, but it would be very, very small, right? So um, every time I measure, I might be off by a very small amount, uh, less than a centimeter or something like that. Um, so I would have variation in my measurements, but it would most likely be very small. Um, in populations, especially when dealing with people, uh, we have huge variation <laughs> over a lot of different variables. So um, it really depends on what you're measuring. Uh, variation is normal, and um, variation can be very interesting in studies. Uh, so just realize that uh, if we're doing precise measurements, maybe there's not a lot of variation, but if we're dealing with you know people, uh, sociology, uh, potentially medicine, things like that, then uh, we're likely to have lots of variation in our samples. So critical evaluation, we want to evaluate statistical studies we read about critically and analyze them before accepting the results. And a lot of people don't do this at all. Um, really, I can't stress enough, you need to evaluate studies that you read about. So if you're reading the newspaper and they're showing you a graph um, and then they're telling you something in the article, does the graph actually match that article? Does the graph have enough information in the graph itself to, to lead you to you know, real conclusions? Or does the graph just look good, but it doesn't actually tell you anything? And I've seen a lot of um, charts and graphs in newspapers and on the news and on the internet and things that uh, look very convincing, but whenever you think about it or whenever you actually try to analyze the graph, it doesn't really tell you anything. But because it looks good, people don't really critically evaluate, critically analyze uh, these graphs. Um, and that's a big problem because a lot of our society just uh, doesn't really analyze the data and makes their own conclusions based on sometimes incorrect data. Uh, it's very dangerous. So some problems. Uh, problems with samples. A sample must be representative of the population. We've already talked about uh, representative samples. Uh, it must be representative of the population if we want correct, true, uh, accurate, good data. Uh, Self-selected samples, responses only by people who choose to respond, such as call-in surveys, are often unreliable. So um, a very interesting thing about most of the, the surveys that I see done by Korean TV and newspapers is that uh, it's basically either done during daytime when most people are at work and they're calling people's homes. So then only people who are at home during the day will be called. So what you get is this kind of self-selected sample of only old people uh, or the older generation who stay home uh, 
uh, will answer the phone and, and answer the questions, whereas the younger generations are at school or at work, and they're not represented in, in this data at all, really. Um, likewise, people who are doing surveys online, uh, if there's surveys online, it's mostly going to be young people. Um, it's uh, younger people, I should say. It's not really going to be like, uh, you know, 75 or older people doing surveys online. It's going to be younger people who are answering those surveys. So it's skewed the other way whenever we're dealing with um, self-selected kind of online surveys or anything to do with technology. Sample size issues. Uh, samples that are too small may be unreliable. It really depends on the type of study that we're doing, but uh, basically if you have less than 30 samples for anything, um, and let's say you're doing a very specific study. If you have less than 30 samples in a very specific study, uh, you, you don't have enough data, basically. Um, if you're doing a very large study with a lot of different variables involved, then 30 is not enough either. Uh, larger samples are better if possible. Of course, always get as much data as possible. Uh, undue inference, uh, undue influence, sorry, uh, is collecting data or asking questions in a way that influences the response. So I also see this a lot of times in a lot of different media, um, people asking questions in ways that makes people either assume the answer or um, influences how they answer uh, or what they think about things. So be very careful about how you're asking questions because the way you ask questions will force people to answer in certain ways, even if you don't realize you're doing it. You need to evaluate how you're asking your questions. Uh, Non-response or refusal uh, of subject to participate. Uh, the collected responses may no longer be representative of the population. So a lot of groups do not talk about their non-response rate. If you have a very large non-response rate, um, it could mean something is... is uh, uh, there could be a problem or the people who actually did respond are not actually representative of the population if your non-response rate um, is is very large. So consider why are, how many people did, did you ask that didn't respond, um, how many people just refused to respond, um, and consider about why they might have done that. Um, and then think about are the people who responded uh, greatly different than the people who didn't respond because it might say something about your population. Uh, causality. So a relationship between two variables does not mean that one causes the other to occur. This is also a huge problem um, uh, that a lot of different studies have. Uh, causality, um, uh, Correl what, what do we say? Correlation does not equal causation, basically. We can have two variables that are highly correlated or look like they have a strong relationship to each other. However, uh, just because they look like they have a strong relationship to each other, each other does not mean that they actually do. Um, so a relationship between two variables does not mean that one causes the other to occur. Um, and we'll talk more about what that is later. Um, also be very, very aware of self-funded or self-interest studies. So self-funded or self-interest studies um, are usually people with some sort of agenda. They want to say something very specific and it might not have anything to do with reality, actually. If it is self-funded or uh, based on some sort of self-interest um, then people will make false claims and then pretend that it's it's true. Um, and what we're doing with statistics is trying to find the actual truth, not what not the truth that people want. We want the real truth, right? Um, so self-funded to self-interest studies uh, tend to be extremely biased. Um, so be be aware of them. And of course, misleading use of data. People can use data and change the way data looks to make it appear. Um, either better or worse than it actually is. And, uh, you know, uh, media does this all the time because they want to sell more papers or whatever it is that they do. Uh, they use data in incorrect ways or uh, make data look a certain way so they can force their own conclusions on it. And then confounding, when the effects of multiple factors uh, on a response cannot be separated. So 
there's a lot of different factors that can affect um, some something that we're we're trying to study. So, for example, uh, let's say that I want to eat labian. Uh, what are the factors that make people eat lamian on a, on a normal day, right? <laughs> well, m you know, maybe maybe one factor that makes people eat lamian more is if it's you know rainy and cold. Uh, people want something you know warm and hot in their belly, so uh, the weather could be one thing. But it could also be uh, you know did their mom make lamian for them whenever they were young, so they have fond memories of it. So that's another factor. Right, so we can find, you know, the action is eating lamian, and we have multiple factors that affect um, what makes a person want to eat lamian. So whenever we have these multiple factors that affects uh, whatever whatever response we're looking for, um, it's very difficult to pick out which one, um, or it can, it can be difficult to pick out which ones actually have an effect in this case. Um, and they might all be affecting at the same time, at the same rate. Okay, levels of measurement. Uh, so levels of measurement is the way that a data set is measured, of course. Uh, nominal scale are like qualitative categories, color, colors, uh, names, labels, favorite foods, yes or no, uh, responses, age, etc. cetera. Uh, ordinal scale, uh, like nominal scale, but can be ordered. Uh, list of the top five national parks in the United States, for example. Interval scale, similar to ordinal. Uh, temperature scales like Celsius, Fahrenheit are measured by using the interval scale. And ratio scale, like interval scale, but it has a zero point and ratios. For example, four multiple choice statistical final exam scores are uh, 80, 68, 20, and 92 out of a possible 100 points. So, um, yeah, ratio scale. Uh, all of this, again, is in the book. Um, just be aware of what these different scales are. Uh, what we're talking about here is just measurement. How can we measure uh, different things? What are the types of measurements we can actually make, and what are those, uh, what are those called whenever we're doing those measurements? Uh, frequency is the number of times a value of the data occurs. Um, so, for example, the number of times that a female answered the question, uh, the number of times that uh, someone called a foreign phone number, something like that. Relative frequency is the ratio of the number of times a value of the data occurs in the set of all outcomes to the total number of outcomes, right? So the ratio of the number of times a value of the data occurs in the set of all outcomes to the total number of outcomes. To get this, we can just divide each frequency by the total number of students, or whatever it is that we're measuring in the sample. So here we have a data value, uh, frequency, and relative frequency. Um, so, uh, right, we'll, t we'll actually talk about this a little bit more later. Okay, all right. So finally, getting to experimental design and ethics. Uh, the purpose of an experiment is to investigate the relationship between two variables. We are trying to, um, whenever we're doing an experiment, investigate relationships between two things. Um, first, we'll talk about uh, you know, uh, descriptive statistics, which just tells us about the data. But whenever we're actually doing experiments, we're attempting to find the relationships between two things. What causes what, what affects what. Uh -huh. uh, so explanatory variable um, is when one variable causes change in another, right? So one variable that causes change in another is the explanatory variable, and the response variable is the variable that is affected by the explanatory variable. So we have an explanatory variable, and that is the variable that we believe causes the change. Right? So if we modify the explanatory variable, let's say we give it different values, then we would expect the response variable to respond with different value outputs. Uh, treatments are different values of the explanatory variable. So we have multiple treatments. These treatments uh, essentially change the value of the explanatory variable, and we observe uh, 
the response variable. So we modify explanatory variable, observe the response variable, and that is considered a treatment. Okay. A control group, a treatment group that receives no treatment. So um, we also need to figure out what is the uh, possibility or probability of a group um, or an event occurring in the group by itself without modifying the uh, explanatory variable. Um, is it possible that a group might, you know, uh, regrow all of their hair naturally, even though whenever we do our study, we measure our, our treatment regrows their hair? Well, what's the probability of hair regrowing naturally? Something like that. So our con control group is actually a treatment group that receives no treatment at all. And what that means is that um, we can observe a sample of the population um, whenever they are just basically nothing is happening to them. And we can compare the group that had nothing happen to them to the group that did have something happen to them and see what the difference is. Uh, a placebo, maybe you've heard of, is a treatment that cannot influence the response variable. So uh, in medicine, a lot of times we use uh, sugar pills as placebos. Um, and what this does is make people think that they are taking uh, a medicine or a real pill. Um, and because people think that they're taking medicine or a real pill, they actually have changes, um, very, very slight changes, but some changes in their body. So we use placebos um, to see, you know, if we give somebody a sugar pill versus a real, uh, a real pill, uh, what's the difference? Is placebo, does the real pill work the same as a sugar pill? If it does, then that means that the real pill doesn't actually do anything because the sugar pill doesn't actually do anything. So if we have a control group, this is a group that doesn't receive any treatment. If we have a group uh, that is given, for example, a placebo, uh, this is a group that thinks they're taking a pill, but um, they're not, essentially. And we can measure if there's any differences between the control group and the placebo group. And then we have the actual experiment. We have the actual group that takes the real pill. Um, and we can see how different was the real pill from the placebo or from the control group. And if there is a significant difference from control or placebo, then that means that our pill is actually doing something. If there's not a significant difference, that means our pill is not doing something. Uh, so having a p uh, control group and a placebo is very um, uh in statistics, you should always have a control group and placebo, um, assuming that you're doing certain types of tests, which we'll talk about later. Okay. Uh, the widespread misuse and misrepresentation of uh, statistical information often gives the field a bad name. People don't really trust statistics because um, uh, some groups manipulate statistics to say whatever they want. Um, the only cure for people manipulating statistics to say whatever they want is for the average person to know how to read statistics and be able to actually look at this and say, hey, this, this isn't right. So, um, it's never acceptable to falsify data, although a lot of different groups, especially in Korea, are falsifying data. Um, it's never acceptable. It is completely immoral uh, to falsify this data because you don't know how that data is going to be used. Um, sometimes, it, whenever you, for example, collect data, if you change it or modify it from the way, the value that it actually is, it could, um, let's say a few years later, be used to evaluate um, whether, you know, aid should be given to a certain country. And because of your data, it looks like a, uh, the country is doing very well, so they don't need any aid. Or um, should there be more health services in that country? Well, if you lied in your data, then people might say, well, this country doesn't need any more health, health uh, services or health care or uh, you know, women's rights or whatever, right? So it's never acceptable to falsify data. Um, it's actually completely immoral, and it can cause long-term uh, damage to society if you do that, depending on what type of data you're looking at. Uh, review boards are normally set up to ensure that researchers are not abusing participants and do not alter uh, data. So review boards, uh, mostly in universities, although 
With my experience, I found that the review boards are sometimes relatively lax. I don't work in medical or anything like that. I do work in social science, but um, the review boards don't appear to be as strict as I think they should be. Um, so just take it on yourself. Do the right thing and do not falsify your data. Um, you know, everyone makes mistakes in data collection sometimes. Just uh, don't do it on purpose. So that is it for um, you know, uh, basic definitions and some information about statistics. Uh, we will get much more into um, descriptive statistics uh, in the next lecture. Thank you very much.